All right, uh, before I start, any uh, open questions I can answer? All right. So in the last couple of lectures, we've uh, talked about indexes and various, uh, well, uh, jump back uh, quite a few, uh, a number of lectures to uh, something we were talking about, indexes and um, indexes and uh, cost-based optimization and the idea that you could uh, take queries and make them run faster if you, uh, if you took a little bit of effort to organize your data in the right way. Um, so far, we've talked about one facet of, uh, of this idea, one uh, approach to organizing your data, uh, namely things like sorting and, and hashing that uh, simply deal with the layout, the way that you actually store the data. Uh, and uh, we've looked at how you can use different approaches to storage uh, to make uh, access more efficient. Today we're going to take uh, we're going to uh, take a different approach uh, to um, uh, we're going to present a different way of uh, organizing your data so that uh, you can access it more quickly and uh, more efficiently. So let me start out with a little bit of an example. Um, uh, yeah, got three queries here. And let's say that my workload consists of uh, a sequence of queries that look exactly like this, or, or that are mild variations of, of queries like this. Um, does anyone see a, a general pattern in these queries? They have the same where clause, okay. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, they're, they're selecting similar items. Yep. They're joining two tables. Which tables? Uh, All of them? Uh, where, where the well, I mean, in each of the queries is joining those same two tables, oh. right? Okay, so there's actually quite a bit of commonality here. So the from clause of each query is completely identical. And uh, the where clause is also identical. And while they're accessing, uh, and they're also kind of selecting the same uh, set of attributes. Uh, in fact, all of the attributes that are getting selected uh, either come from the line item table or are computed as some sort of aggregate over attributes that we could get from the line item table. Now, oh, missed one. Now, let's say you're writing some code. Uh, what happens when you see a, a particular block of code repeated over and over and over again? Yeah, if uh, you're, uh, you have some, some block of code, uh, let's say uh, a block of code that uh, computes the, um, the average of a set of numbers. What would you do if you were writing a, a program and found that you had uh, a for loop in three places in your code and uh, that for loop uh, was doing exactly the same thing? Yeah. You'd refactor it into a function. And databases are exactly the same. So in a database, uh, this same concept, this idea of abstracting uh, a relation that appears frequently in your queries uh, is, uh, exists just as well. Uh, and in databases, this is call, uh, what's called a view. So uh, the basic syntax for a view uh, looks almost exactly like a select query. In fact, it is a select query, uh, but you're all, uh, it also has uh, a little uh, block on top of it, create view sales since last month, for example, um, that define, uh, that basically gives that query a name. 
so when we uh, tell the database to create a view, uh, give it a name, and then a, a query to define it, that's basically telling the database, here, this, this particular uh, idea, this concept, uh, is something that we want to uh, refer to repeatedly. And um, it defines a, a view, sales since last month, that we can reference pretty much anywhere as if it were a normal relation. So you can see the sales since last month uh, name uh, ends up, we can rewrite the three queries that I, I showed you earlier um, by referencing just uh, that uh, view. Now, there's a couple of nice features of a view definition like this. Um, the most important of which is the fact that it doesn't actually compute anything, um, at least not up front. It tells you how to compute something, uh, just like a function, but it doesn't actually uh, do any work. Uh, so if I just tell the database, create this view, create view sin sales since last month, um, I'm telling it how to compute the sales since last month, or in this case, the sales since last year. Um, and I'm, uh, any time that I run a query using that view, um, it's effectively the behavior of that query uh, works just as if I had um, essentially put a, uh, works just as if I had uh, taken that sales since last month table and expanded it out uh, into a nested uh, select statement, a from nested select statement. Um, really, that's uh, at the the core. I this is the core idea of a view. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, in fact, it does both. So uh, it creates a new relation in the database. So from the database's perspective, uh, anytime you write a query, anytime it sees orders since last month, that effectively refers to uh, a relation. You can treat it just like a table. I'll get into that. It's, there's a little bit of a caveat there. Um, but you can treat it just like a, a, a table for the most part. Uh, but you're right, that it effectively acts as a pointer. It doesn't actually, uh, and again, uh, I'm saying this with a few caveats that I'll get into later, uh, but it doesn't actually save anything. It doesn't store anything. Uh, the behavior is that of a pointer. It's saying, this is a relation that's ordered since last month, and you compute it by going to the line item table, joining it with orders, running this where clause, and then uh, projecting out the attributes in, uh, that appear in line item. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so um, I've gotten to this point. Uh, I've told you what a view is. Uh, I've told you that it behaves just like a normal relation, uh, and I've told you that uh, pretty much anywhere that you use a normal relation, you can just use uh, a view, and everything works, and everyone's happy, and we can all go home, right? I see people nodding. No, wrong, wrong answer. No, no. There's, so I said there were also a couple of caveats. Um, so. A view behaves a lot like a normal relation, but there's a couple of uh, key differences uh, that arise from the fact that it is, in effect, a pointer. Um, so the first of these differences uh, is the fact that when line item and orders changes, the view contents effectively change as well. Uh, the second of those differences uh, is that um, unlike a typical relation, what happens if I try and do an insertion into, uh, into a view or an update to a view? Um, and the last of these is, uh, well, OK, we have this wonderful way of abstracting uh, components, uh, abstracting this, this concept 
of orders since last month. And that really helps me out when I'm writing queries. But how do we actually, uh, can we actually use that uh, to make query processing more efficient? And so we're going to look at all these three problems. Uh, how do we uh, deal with the fact that the, well, actually, let me do those in reverse order. Uh, how do we make query evaluation more efficient uh, if we have one of these views? First. Uh, second, how do we deal with the fact that the underlying data can change over time? Uh, and then three, how do we, um, how do we actually uh, create an even better illusion that these views are actually relations, that you can actually uh, manipulate them as if they were regular, ordinary database tables? Now, the last one is actually a whole field of, of database research. I'm only going to be able to uh, touch the, the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, if you're interested, there's uh, both pointers and courses at UB that I can uh, point you at uh, that go into more depth there. Uh, but OK, so any questions so far? All right. So let's, uh, let's start uh, tackling these problems one at a time. So the first thing um, that I'd like to tackle is what happens, um, yeah. the first thing I'd like to tackle is how do we use this uh, to make query processing more efficient? Any thoughts? Yeah. Could cut down on the number of IOs. How? Oh, that's a great observation. So, uh, Let's go back to the, the first set of queries. This particular uh, s set of queries all have the same pattern in them. They all have uh, a join between line item and orders, and they're particularly interested in orders that occurred after March, 1st, uh, March 31st, 2015. Now, if you have a particular pattern that's appearing over and over and over and over in your queries, and uh, more importantly, if uh, the, the DBA, or the, the database administrator, uh, comes to you and says, oh, by the way, here is a particular pattern that's going to occur over and over and over and over and over again in your queries, well, we can actually do something with that. We can uh, pre-compute all of the data that should be in sales since last month and uh, store it right uh, either in memory, ideally, uh, or if necessary, we can still store it on disk as a regular database table. Now, when a query comes along, it's not doing a join between line item and orders. It's just reading directly from those query results. Uh, if they're in memory, great. If they're not, even if they're not in memory, you can still uh, run each of these queries much more uh, quickly because you don't need to perform that join. You don't need to uh, filter out uh, any data because you've, you've already filtered out all of the, the orders that have occurred uh, before that particular date. You've already filtered out the corresponding line, excuse me, line items. Uh, and you've already projected away all of the attributes of orders because they're not relevant. So essentially, this is a way of the, the, the uh, user telling the database, I'm going to keep a uh, asking this particular question, um, and the database uh, can respond to that by actually pre-computing those values. Now, uh, typically, uh, the way that this, this works in, in a, uh, a traditional database is that you'd uh, take, uh, you'd um, specify not just uh, create view, you'd um, specify uh, you tell the database uh, to create what's called a materialized view. In other words, the database has been, uh, you, you, 
basically the database takes this query, pre-computes it, and puts it on disk. OK, great. Uh, questions about this general idea? Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, no. So if you uh, tell it to create a view, it's essentially just storing the pointer. Uh, if you tell it to create a materialized view, it'll pre-compute the query and put the query results on disk. Does that address your question? Uh, and in a particularly intelligent database might potentially pre-materialize. Uh, if you're telling it to, to uh, create a view, the database could potentially decide that it might be worth pre-computing it. And, and but in, in general, if you say create view, that just stores it as a pointer. Uh, create it as a materialized view, it pre actually does the pre-computation. OK, so this sounds good. Um, we can run our, our queries over these, view, uh, these materialized views uh, much faster. Do I want to do this for everything? No? Why? What problems might I run into? Hmm? OK, so you could run out of memory. But uh, even if you store everything to disk, hard disks are cheap. Uh, you, know, you can get a couple of petabytes for maybe a few thousand dollars. Uh, for a business that really, really needs their queries to run fast, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But even that business, even that business that's willing to spend thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of dollars on organizing their data efficiently, um, even they still may not want to uh, create all of the materialized views that they could think of. Yeah? Bingo. What happens when the data changes? So what happens when we insert something into line item or insert something into orders? How do we react to that? You have to redo the computation. OK. So, uh, one, uh, so if we want to keep the view materialized, if we want to keep using this uh, nice and, and improved uh, way of answering queries, we're going to have to recompute the entire thing from scratch. Or do we? And this is where uh, what I think is a really, really cool area of databases uh, comes in. Something called uh, incremental view maintenance. So. A very nice deck of slides for this. Um, and I apologize, I'm going to stop using slides for a little bit just um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, but I wanted to, to grab one particular visual from, from this slide deck. So let's say we have our database. Now, uh, we want to create a materialized view. And like I said, a materialized view is really just a query. So we've got our data, and we've got our query. Now what happens if we want to change the data? So you know, let's say we give our database a little top hat. We also want that change to be reflected in the query. How do we do that? And can, more importantly, can we do that without actually rewriting the entire uh, database, uh, rewriting, rerunning the entire uh, database query. All right. So. Let's start out with a little bit of uh, terminology here. So first things first, uh, we need some way to refer to the database. So let's call the database. Uh, by the way, let me know if I'm going off screen. Um, we can refer to the database as D. We've got some query.
And uh, the result of the query, look at that as just a function. Oops. Now we also have some sort of change that has just happened. I'm going to label that delta d. And just to be clear, a change can be something like an uh, and change can be something like an insert, a delete, an update, um, and that's the big three. So I either insert a row into a table, uh, I delete a row from a table, uh, or I change the contents of a row. So the idea, basically, is that what we have when we start the entire process is the results. We have Q of D. And we also have this change. And I'm going to use very informal notation here, but basically what we're looking for uh, Q, what we want is Q of D with uh, this change incorporated into it. Now I'm using plus because plus kind of conveys the basic idea, but I want you to think a little bit about how I would actually represent that plus. How I, I could actually encode uh, this idea of taking uh, database, uh, taking a, a database and inserting a change into it. So how do we actually do this? And I'm going to use the white switch over to the oh, the whiteboard so I can keep this uh, project in, uh, projecting. But what we want is oh, sorry, I'm skipping one thing. So I'm skipping one uh, one thing. Um, in that we could achieve this, we could get Q of, of D plus delta D uh, by recomputing the entire query from scratch. But instead, what we'd like uh, is to be able to do this much more efficiently. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we can come up with some sort of, uh, again, vague, fuzzy uh, notion at the moment. I'll make that precise over the, the course of the, the lecture. But what we'd like uh, is some sort of plus operator that we can effectively commute through a query. Uh, we'd like to be able to use our original result and using that original result incorporate some sort of change, some sort of uh, delta query um, that we might need to compute using the original database as well as the change. And the idea is that we already have this. And if we can compute this, this delta query more quickly, more efficiently, and this integration, this, this plus operator, if we can also compute that quickly, then we can do increment, then we can do view maintenance. We can, we can um, update a view to include uh, a new value um, much more efficiently than recomputing the entire query from scratch. Now, questions on the, the general idea? All right. Uh, there's never any chalk. So, as with any large problem like this, once we've stated the basic idea, uh, let's actually start going in uh, and looking at it case by case uh, to try and come up with at least some intuition uh, for how we might uh, approach this problem uh, overall. So again, we have 
a query result. And what we'd like to do is figure out how that query result changes um, in response to a change uh, in, in the database. So um, let's start off with a really simple model where we only have one type of change. We're going to insert a row into, a database, uh, into one table of a database. So we've got some relation r. And this relation r is going to get turned into r plus, um, is going to get turned into r union, and let's use bag semantics here. So r bag union some new relation. OK, so this gives us a starting point. This delta d is going to look basically like this. So whenever, uh, so the change in r is basically going to be this new set of rows. So let's say we have some query. Relational algebra is nice in that it it's compositional, and we can look at each operator independently. And if we have some change in the input relation, uh, we can figure out how to compute the change in the output relation. Uh, so if we've got, uh, if the original query is just r, what's our delta query? What is the change in this query? Yep. So R union delta. Uh, so that's the new version of the query. What's the, the change? What's the difference between the two? Uh, delta. delta. And so for this case, we can compute the, uh, the, the new query, the new query results. Uh, so we can get q of r uh, plus delta r uh, ends up being essentially q. Well, there's no database in here. Uh, bag union delta q. All right, really trivial case. Let's move on to something more interesting. So what if we've got a query? And this query is the projection of something. Let's call this Q1. Let's call this Q2. So I'm computing the projection, uh, I'm applying the projection operator to something. I don't know what this is. But let's say that I do know how that something changes. So I don't know, I don't know how to, well, I know how to compute s, but, um, I, but I do know uh, exactly how s changes. So what would, what would the change be? Uh, s, uh, missing something? Projection. So yeah, and this actually emerges from uh, some of the uh, relational algebra properties that we've, uh, that we've looked at earlier. Um, the projection of A union bag union B uh, is equivalent to the projection of A bag union, the projection of B. 
It turns out we can actually use these uh, rules uh, quite liberally throughout this whole process. So if I define uh, a new query Q3, which is the selection of some S, what's my uh, delta Q3? On. Anyone see the pattern? Yeah? Thank you. All right. And again, the same thing. Select of uh, A union B is equivalent to uh, the selection of A union the selection of B. Uh, OK. So we've gotten two of the major operators. Uh, union basically behaves exactly the same. In fact, the only really, really tricky one here uh, is cross product. Well, cross product and aggregation. We'll get to aggregation in a bit. In fact, let's go over here. Q4 is um, Let's break, the, let's break this down into uh, a couple of different cases. So let's say we've got R, the relation that's changing, and S, which is some other relation that isn't changing. How might we go about uh, computing the delta version of this query? Yeah. Delta R. And how'd you, uh, delta R cross S, how'd you come about that? So, change between R and delta R, delta Okay, so R, so. So, at least in principle, what we're going for here is uh, we're trying to compute the new Q which is going to be equal to Q4, the original Q4, plus, I'm going to, let's use union uh, as that plus for now. So I take my original query, which is R cross S, I bag union it with this new, uh, this new thing, and what I should end up with, at least in principle, is R bag union delta R, cross S. So from that, how do you get to, uh, how do you get to delta, uh, delta R cross S? Well, R cross S union delta R cross S cross S. Say again? So you throw that as the R cross S union delta R cross S. Okay. So, uh, join uh, distributes over, uh, over union. So we get R uh, cross S bag union delta R cross S. And we've already got R cross S, yeah. So this and this are the same. Great, so that means that R, delta R cross S is what we're looking for. Keep moving up. OK, so that's, that's uh, a, that up. so that's nice so far. Can we go further? Um, so what happens, uh, what happens? Is this symmetric, by the way? Can we do this uh, if we have S cross R? Yeah, uh, union and join are both associative. So uh, this works just as well if you have uh, S cross R. What happens if you have uh, R cross R?
would just be delta R. Well, so let's, before we go into computing the delta query itself, let's uh, figure out what the, the new query would look like. So Q5 bag union delta Q5, what would that be? R union delta R. Cross R union delta R. OK. That looks nasty. All right, time to, time to go back to, uh, to high school algebra. Um, Oh. Time to go back to algebra. Um, well, we've got distributivity. Uh, what can we do with this? So what if I just, for the moment, uh, let's call this, I'm going to call this M. We've got delta R, bag union delta R cross M. R cross M, bag union, delta R cross M. OK. Well, that makes our lives a little bit easier. We've expanded something out. Uh, all right, well, let's expand the whole thing out. So we've got R cross R bag union delta R. Whole thing bag union delta, oh, go to the next line, delta R cross the whole thing over again. All right, that's still kind of nasty. Can we do, can we simplify that? Remember, what we're going for, we like to see somewhere in that query, we'd like to see R cross R. OK, so we can distribute the R over that whole thing. Huh. Do not make chalk like they used to. R cross R. Bag union. R cross delta R. Bag union delta R. And I'm going to shorten it to that. All right. Um, union is nice and associative. So we can drop most of these parentheses. I uh, can drop those parentheses. And what do you know? We've got this R cross R here. So this is Q5, and this whole thing then becomes delta Q5. Flashbacks to basic uh, variable elimination here. Uh, the algebra variable elimination, not the um, graphical <laughs> models. Um, OK, great. So it looks like we've come up with a couple of rules for ourselves. So at least with respect to the basic uh, three operations, uh, unions are actually fairly straightforward as well. Um, but if we have um, some relation, so delta D is basically we're going to take R and we're going to turn it into R bag union uh, delta R. 
Um, any other relation? Uh, so, uh, rephrase this. Uh, yeah. So if we have um, a query, Q of R, this turns into Q of R plus, uh, plus delta D. Um, and right. Uh, and so, oops, ignore that. Um, if the query itself is just R, then, uh, or Q of D is just R, then Q of uh, D plus delta D uh, is R bag union delta R. There's the original query. There's the delta. Um, if Q of D is uh, the projection of something, uh, then Q of D plus delta D is going to be uh, the projection of the something, uh, bag union, uh, the projection of the change in something. And again, this is the original query, and this is uh, the change query. Um, and then we've got Q of, uh, where are we? Q of D is selection of S. Q of D plus delta D is exactly the same thing. And we have the same thing for union. Uh, so Q of uh, D is uh, S union S prime. Uh, then Q of D plus delta D is just going to be um, S union S prime union delta S union uh, delta S prime. And then the final really big one is uh, if your query is um, S join S prime, then uh, uh, is going to be uh, S cross S prime union S cross delta S prime union delta S cross uh, S prime union delta S cross delta S prime. Once again, we have our original query, and we've got our delta query. All right. So why have I uh, why have I been talking about these these delta queries uh, as being somehow special? Well, it means that we can uh, do these uh, we can do these transformations uh, compositionally. So let me give you a, a concrete example. Mm, where are we? There we go. Let me give you a concrete example uh, where we're looking for uh, one of the queries. Uh, we have. Uh, I believe this is uh, query three, TPCH query three. We've got uh, select 
from customer orders and line item. And a uh, customer has a filtering predicate on it. Uh, it joins with a uh, filtering product uh, predicate over uh, line item. Uh, and that whole thing joins with uh, filtering predicate over orders. OK. So let's say that we have already materialized this entire query. And suddenly, there's uh, an insertion into line item. How would we go about computing uh, how this view should react with respect to a change in, excuse me, a change in line item? So. We have an insertion into line item. So we've got this big, giant query over there. How could we look at it? So what's at the, the very top of that query? Join. Uh, you can assume for uh, the time being, uh, and feel free to prove this yourselves uh, to yourselves, uh, but you get exactly the same behavior uh, for joins as for cross products. So let's actually expand that out. So we've got uh, the entire query, the overall query is equal to um, some query, let's call it query 1, joined with query 2. OK, uh, what's our rule for this? Well, we expand the entire thing out. So if we want to compute the delta query for this whole thing, that's going to be these three terms. Um, that's going to be uh, delta, uh, nope. That's going to be q1 join delta q2 union q1, uh, sorry, delta q1 join Q2 union delta Q Q1 join delta Q2. It's the whole delta query. Question so far? OK. Um, all right, so what are each of these? Well, let's go back to our query. So Q1, let's annotate this a little bit. We've got this whole thing we're calling this for now Q1. And this whole thing for now we're calling uh, Q2. So Q1 doesn't actually include line item in it, which means what? It stays the same. So delta Q1, and you can actually prove this by going through the entire set of rules until you get to the very end, uh, but Q1, uh, sorry, delta Q1 is empty. So this whole thing is the empty set. And this whole thing is the empty set. So what do you get if you join the empty set with something? The empty set, which 
means this whole thing goes to the empty set. And this whole thing goes to the empty set. By the way, does anyone, anyone, this seems awfully familiar. You, you take something by, uh, that, that's like z empty or zero or something, and you, you throw some operation at it, and you combine it with anything, and you get back another zero. Anyone? Multipl yeah, this seems awfully like multiplication, doesn't it? And anyway, uh, what do we get when we take the uh, empty set and we union, union it with something else? Something else? That, does that seem awfully familiar too? Addition, yeah. Okay. Come up in a bit. Um, so you take this entire thing, turns into the empty set, empty set, uh, it added to the empty set, added to something, gives us Oh, whoops, I got this backwards. Oh, no, I didn't. That whole empty set gives us uh, Q1 join uh, delta Q2. All right, great. So if we can figure out what delta Q2 is, that's going to produce a result. Uh, it's going to produce a, a result. So now we need to uh, repeat the whole process doing a join of uh, the selection on customer. Let's call that uh, Q3. And the join on line item, let's call that Q4. So we go through the whole uh, rigmar rigmarole all over again. And we, get, uh, we realize that Q3 uh, also doesn't contain line item which means delta Q3 is empty, which means that the entire thing reduces to Q1, uh, sorry, the entire delta Q2 turns into um, Q3 join with delta, oops, delta Q4. Once again, we need to figure out what delta Q4 is. Uh, but this, in this case, it's much simpler. Uh, Q4 is just a selection over line item, which means that what we end up with is uh, Q3 joined with a selection over uh, delta line item. So whatever rows got inserted into line item, those rows also come out uh, of uh, the selection. Um, and that means that the whole plug that in to delta Q2, which means that whenever line item changes, you run, well, let me put it on here. Uh, whenever line item changes, you can uh, essentially run this new query, uh, delta Q, uh, which is uh, selection over uh, orders, joined with uh, selection over uh, line, uh, sorry, over customer. Uh, joined with um, a selection over the change in line item. So we went through all of that effort. We came up with this uh, query here. What have we accomplished? Is this actually going to end up being cheaper than rerunning the entire query from scratch? Let's look at some complexities. So let's say that I have, uh, let's say that M 
records make it through the selection on customer. Let's say that uh, n records make it through uh, line item. And let's say that uh, o records make it through the selection on orders. And you know what? Let's make our lives a little bit simpler. Let's uh, just say that uh, these are cross products. What would the size of my output relation be if those were cross products, not joins? m times n times o. And moreover, we can turn that back into uh, an estimation of the size of, of the output relation uh, by running a filtering predicate. Uh, essentially, we can expect that a filtering that the joins uh, act as, as filtering predicates over the cross product. Uh, so we can expect that it's going to be some constant fraction of m times n times o. Does that apply here? to the delta query? What's our size? So this chunk here? O. Oh. This chunk here? N. All right, well, it's not looking good so far. How about that chunk? Oh, oh thank you. How about that chunk? How many rows are we going to expect to see there? At most, one. Delta li, the change in line item, we're only inserting one row into line item. Or, well, we may be inserting multiple rows, so we're still uh, inserting a fixed number of rows into line item. So this is going to be closer to a small constant. So. We haven't actually saved anything on this part, although there are some techniques for uh, making that more efficient. But we have saved ourselves quite a bit on this one term. The overall cost of the delta query is going to be a lot cheaper than the overall cost of the original query. And uh, what, what was so? What, what were the two things that we needed to to do? We needed to make sure that. Uh, so we already have Q of D. We've established now that delta Q is going to be faster, maybe not necessarily super fast, but at least faster than recomputing the original query from scratch. We've also uh, come up with at least a very loose definition of this uh, combination operator, uh, bag union. Bag union is pretty fast. It just means take the chunk of data here and stick the other chunk of data here. So we've basically, going through this whole process of, of uh, computing a delta query, we've been able to come up with a query that reacts to a change in line item uh, and produce it and is able to tell us how, uh, how our, our view needs to be updated. Uh, and that delta query is a lot cheaper than rerunning the entire query from scratch. Questions so far? All right, so either all of you are following or asleep. Um, following? OK. All right, let's do a little bit of a, a quick digression. Uh, just to make sure that, well, you'll see why the digression is relevant in a few moments. So first off, let's talk a little about a little bit about bags. So let's say that I have uh, a bag. Um, here's here's a bag. One one one. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, let's call it two, 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 three, three, four, 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 uh, four, and five. All right. We've got a bag. That seems like an awful lot of space. 
can I maybe do that? In, can I convey the same idea using less chalk? Yeah. All right, so let's say that I represented this as, uh, what do I got? Three copies of one. Uh, I've got five copies of two. Let's quote them. I've got two copies of three. And I've got six copies of four. And I got one copy of five. All right. Well, that's kind of cool. A um, little bit less space. Uh, definitely makes things a little bit easier to write. Um, so we're talking about change and changing data. So let's maybe look at how uh, a bag, in particular a bag with this type of representation, uh, changes when we change the data. So let's say we insert, I don't know, a 1. What happens? Yeah, if, uh, this turns into 4. Uh, and in fact, what happens when, let's say, I've got another bag uh, which has, let's say, uh, three copies of two uh, and maybe uh, two copies of five. What do I do to combine those two bags together? Ah, oh, nice. There's a summation going on here. I take all of the records, I pair them up, and then I sum the results together. So I'd end up with uh, five plus two copies of two. Uh, sorry, five plus three copies of two. Uh, and I'd end up with um, one plus uh, two copies of five. Now, something that I've kind of been hovering around uh, and haven't directly addressed in the lecture so far is the idea that um, it is the other types of modifications that we could potentially do. So, so far we've been looking entirely at uh, insertions because insertions you can represent very con conveniently, very compactly uh, as uh, a bag union of two different bags. What about deletion? Subtraction? So set subtraction or uh, which type of subtraction? Bags. OK, and how do I implement bag subtraction? The opposite of how I implemented union. OK, so what's the opposite? So what did we do? We did a, uh, arith arithmetic addition to, to do that. What's the opposite? Arithmetic subtraction. Um, and well, there's a nice, uh, nice observation here. Um, if you uh, want to uh, subtract b from a, uh, that is equivalent to negating b and adding b. So let's say that instead, what I wanted to do, uh, let's, let's say what I wanted to do instead was uh, delete the elements in this bag from the original bag. Well, I could conceptually, at least, think of this uh, as creating a kind of anti-value, negative multiplicity. So it's a little bit uh, trippy to think of it that way. But why can't I have negative multiplicity there? 
Why can't I have a negative multiplicity there? So I have three anti-copies of 2 and two anti-copies of 5. And if I combine the two bags together, the anti-copies cancel out with the original copies. Negative 3 plus 5 is 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. It's a little bit weird. So I've kind of created a little bit of a problem for myself because now I can, if I, I can have anti-tuples in, in an arbitrary bag. Well, it means I can have anti-tuples in uh, any bag. Um, but overall, this actually seems like it might uh, make sense. And what's really cool about this is that all of the stuff we've talked about up till now works just as well for anti-tuples. In fact, all I need to do at the very end is figure out how many copies I have of each tuple, how many copies I have of each anti-tuple, cancel the two out, and uh, the very final result is going to be whatever I get uh, by doing that. Now, I um, was hoping to have a little bit more time uh, to expand on that, uh, but if you're interested in this type of, uh, uh, of work, uh, there's a whole bunch of really, really fun uh, research going on, um, and I encourage you to talk to me about it. Uh, but, right, so anti-tuples. Uh, okay, so that handles insertions and deletions. So the third type of, uh, of uh, database update was just a regular update, uh, where we want to change a value, replace one value with a different value. Um, you can get arbitrarily uh, complex with this, but it turns out that if you have insertion and deletion, uh, then you actually, have, uh, you actually have updates as well for free. I'll give you an example. Uh, what happens if you want to change this one into a five? Yeah. Delete the one out of five. So an update you can essentially uh, express as a bag that combines both tuples and anti-tuples. So negative one copy of one and uh, one copy of five. And once I add this bag into this bag, I've got, effectively, I've applied an update. You can get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more efficiency if you go into it, but unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into that. Uh, so instead, I will leave you with um, one last direction. Uh, right. So shifting gears uh, entirely here, um, so we've, we've so far talked about how we change materialized views with respect, uh, with respect to changes in the underlying data. Um, what I kind of hinted at was that we might also be able to uh, create a, so back up, uh, the, this allows us to treat relations not, uh, sorry, treat views uh, as relations in that uh, we can read from a view just as efficiently as we could read uh, from a normal relation. But what it doesn't get us is the ability to modify the view directly. So let's say I have, uh, I thought I had an example of this, I do not. Um, so. Let's say that I wanted to do an insertion into uh, a materialized view. Well, what kind of trouble could I get into there? So let's say I've got my Go back to my original query here. Here's 
one copy. Let's say that I wanted to, um, one of the, the uh, I, I was looking through uh, the results of this view and decided for whatever reason that one of the, the records had the wrong uh, status code, for example. So let's say that I wanted to run a query along the lines of, um, So let's say I wanted to pick one of the, the orders and uh, change the status code uh, of, um, of all of the, oh, actually that, oh, no, that works. Uh, let's say that I wanted to update uh, the sales since last month view uh, and change the status code on all of the line items, uh, or, excuse me, all of the records of sales since last month where the status code was Q. So first off, does this even make sense? That's a great observation. Um, we would, in general, actually want to go back to the original uh, relation. But there are some cases where, um, well, even that sometimes has problems. So in this particular example, there is a very nice correspondence between, uh, and I was getting tripped up by this uh, just now, um, there's a very nice correspondence between uh, the rows of line item and the rows of sales since last month. That correspondence isn't guaranteed to always be there. Um, so let's say that I have uh, 10 different data sources, and I'm trying to uh, data sets from five different stores, or for 10 different stores, let's say, um, and I'm trying to combine all of them together. Now I have this one view that is basically a union over all of those 10 stores, the data sets from all of those 10 stores. just purely from a user interface perspective, it's a lot easier to change it in the, the view uh, in the view because all of your data is there. If you've got all of it in one big data set, uh, one big layout, you just want to be able to change the one record where it is and that gets see that it gets propagated to the right place. And more importantly, it may not always be clear which data source a particular record uh, comes from. So, for example, let's say I wanted to insert a new record into sales since last month. Um, a new sale has just occurred and I want to run a query that takes into account that new record. This is actually a really uh, general problem uh, called data exchange. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, there's a whole slew of research in that area. We've got some classes on it, I th although to double check if there's an undergrad version, but there's uh, definitely a lot of research in that area. However, uh, something that I wanted to make you aware of is that you can also use um, what are called uh, triggers. Um, no, we haven't covered. Uh, these things called triggers that react to different events in the database. And one type of trigger is, uh, allows you to implement uh, these types of friendly user interfaces for views. Uh, so for example, I could create a uh, trigger that responds to insertions on sales since last month 
And instead of doing the actual insertion, because the database has no clue how to do that, uh, it's going to go and look at every single row, and it's going to figure out whether that sale corresponds to an existing order key. And if it doesn't correspond to an existing order key, it's going to actually uh, create a new order record that corresponds to it. Um, now, the critical thing here is that the trigger is actually providing all of the logic. It's, it's telling the database, this is how you handle an insertion on the view. Um, and it essentially goes from the, the uh, user-friendly uh, view uh, presentation. Uh, it tells the database how to go to the actual data insertion that you should be doing in the first place, if all, all else being equal. All right, um, just wanted to make sure I brought that up. Uh, with that, see everyone on Thursday.